I am well aware that this is a fictitious republic, but it's not impossible to realize it in several respects. So I translate, uh, this is how the Chevalier Jocourt described Plato's Republic in L'Encyclopédie. For my part, I wanted to show that the constitution proposed by James Harrington in the Commonwealth of Oceania has served as a political model in 18th century France until the revolution. How did a book published in London in 1656 and which remained untranslated until the year three of the revolution, uh, so that is uh, 1795, managed to circulate and spread among the French speaking public, feeding what could be called a Republican tradition even before the revolution? So this is uh, obviously the question I've tried to address in the, in the book. In this presentation, I will proceed in three stages. First, I will outline the key features of Harrington's Equal Republic to know what we're talking about. Then I will turn to its reception in English, uh, in England first and in 18th century France. Finally, I will discuss the main historiographical issues raised by the research I have carried out. So first, uh, Harrington's equal commonwealth. This, this is the way he uh, designates his uh, uh, republic. In, in 1656, when the Commonwealth of Oceania came out, the monarchy and the House of Lords had been abolished along with the Church of England. It gave way to a republican system, the Commonwealth, governed by a single house and a council of state, and then from 1653, to the protectorate, a system based on a unicameral parliament and an executive body defined in England's first and last written constitution, the instrument of government. However, facing political instability within and geopolitical instability without, um, and facing the difficulty of implementing political and religious reforms Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector, assumed power with an appointed parliament uh, then on his own from the end of 1654. The Commonwealth of Oceania by Harrington therefore offered the model of an ideal republic. The book was initially seized before being released in two uh, competing editions uh, in published, both published in London but we don't have the manuscript. <laughs> so we have these two original editions. The work opens with a preliminary discourse in which Harrington describes the transition from ancient to modern prudence from a government founded on the common interest, the Roman Republic, to the government of one or a small group of men who govern according to their own interests, the empire. According to Harrington, this form of government based on, a ne an, uh, sorry, on an, an equal distribution of wealth, continued in medieval England to the detriment of the people. This regime he calls the Gothic balance. It was Henry VII who, out of distrust of the nobility, freed the peasants and gave them access to property thereby encouraging the emergence of a class of independent freeholders, husbandmen, ready to bear arms if they felt their freedom was at stake, uh, was at stake. So these are, well, imperfect representations because we have a 19th century representation and an Italian representation, but uh, to be seen at the Victoria and Albert Museum what can be a husbandman, that is a prosperous, prosperous uh, peasant. The historical exposition was followed by a description of Oceana's constitution, detailing the fundamental laws, which he calls foundations, and institutions, which he calls superstructures of the Republic. Dialogues between the fictional characters allowed to discuss the merits and drawbacks of such provisions. 
as in the famous fresco of good government in Siena, there is a continuum between the countryside and the capital emporium. The former, a land of plenty, supplies the republic with hardy farmers. The latter is the seat of Oceana's institutions. From a literary point of view, Oceana is a composite work that belongs to the historical and political treaties and the utopian genre. As Colin Davis has shown, the device allowed to represent the institutions to future citizens while making it possible to distance itself from its political message. It's but romance, it's utopia. To establish such a government, the first step consisted in dividing the population into citizens and servants, with only the former taking part in the election of representatives. These citizens would be further divided according to age and wealth. Furthermore, two fundamental laws had to be enacted. Um, the first fundamental law regulates the distribution of land. Revisiting the typology of political forms inherited <coughs> from classical thought, Harrington gives them a material underpinning, believing that you, we move from one political regime to the next, not by process of natural corruption, which is what Polybius, who was extremely popular, obviously, in 17th century England, had uh, argued, but by successive transfers in land property. In his view, the civil wars of the 1640s arose from a disjunction between the balance of property and the balance of power. From this, he derived an axiom to which his name is still attached. The balance of powers, uh, power depends on the balance of property. Uh, so from there, he uh, derived uh, he drew conclusions as to the kind of, uh, well, uh, the kind of uh, uh, succession laws uh, which, uh, uh, well, on which uh, every political regime uh, was grounded. Um, so in a monarchy or aristocracy, obviously, the underpinning law was the law of primogeniture. Whereas in a well-established commonwealth, and this is obviously the case of Oceana, an inheritance law known as agrarian must set a threshold uh, for inherited property. Uh, so this, uh, well, he gives a threshold uh, of 2,000 pounds a year maximum, uh, fixing the maximum uh, uh, of the portion one can inherit, uh, and to him, uh, this was the means by which property could be distributed within the family, uh, as well as within the commonwealth. Uh, the second fundamental law uh, consisted, consists of a voting system inspired by the Venetian model, uh, the ballot, which Harrington tells us puts equality at the heart of the republic. And of course, the use he is making of this notion of equality needs to be, well, uh, scrutinized. But it's interesting he uh, uses uh, this term, just as he uses the, the, the term uh, democracy. He claims uh, the, 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 the label uh, democracy. Unlike the most radicals who were ready to dispense with a second chamber, he remained attached to the principle of bicameralism. But instead of the formerly hereditary chamber, the other house should be elected. Legislative power was therefore distributed between two elected assemblies represented, uh, representing two social classes. The Senate, made up of large landowners, debated and proposed laws, while the People's Assembly, uh, uh, made up of small land owners and being as large as possible, he insisted, voted them. Uh, this assembly he called the tribe or the prerogative assembly. 
uh, this distribution seemed to him to ensure social equilibrium or, or balance so that no group would be tempted to harm the other. Um, and to represent this sharing, he used the image which Sieyès and others took up again in the 18th century, which became extremely famous, that of two little girls sharing a cake. <coughs> um, basically, the idea is the one who cuts the cake is not the one who's going to distribute them, so that no one, uh, neither of them should be, uh, should be, uh, uh, well, um, uh, should lose from the, the well, the, the sharing. Um, he, um, and this is something we had to discuss on the occasion of the, the, the PhD defense about the levelers. He seems to have uh, taken up again some of the levelers' concerns uh, for a large representation of the people. Uh, and uh, therefore, he gave a central place to the rotation of electoral offices, but uh, with a caveat, reducing it to an annual renewal by thirds of the two assemblies when the levelers wanted an annual complete renewal of uh, 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 parliament every year. Uh, Harrington, therefore, proposed a form of government in which a natural aristocracy, this idea of natural aristocracy is very important, tempered uh, democracy but where the final decision rested with the popular assembly. In this respect, he followed the Aristotelian precept, precept revised by Machiavelli, namely that a people is more constant and better than a prince, but the democratic element is obviously balanced by the aristocratic component. Such a system allowed him to proclaim uh, the people sovereign or king people, as uh, appears in Oceana. Um, after the preliminary discourse where such principles are exposed, uh, Harrington embarked on an exercise in codification which he called political architecture or the art of legislating, uh, which is the title of another of his book uh, he published later. And this, uh, this was one of the hypotheses of my uh, study um, uh, because, uh, well, this exercise in codification actually became a classic of the 18th century. Think of the various constitutional drafts drawn up in Corsica, Geneva, Poland, uh, the United Provinces, and the Russia of Catherine II. Uh, so my question was whether uh, Harrington could have, uh, uh, well, influenced, well, for the moment I stick to the term, uh, uh, the constitution and drafters of the 18th century. Uh, so in my view, it became clear that Harrington embodied a specific orientation of English political thought in the 17th century, and as such, um, uh, well, at, at a time when the debates on the relationship between property and liberty, property distribution and liberty were lively. Um, and so this is um, uh, what I try to examine, looking at his reception uh, in, um, well, first his immediate reception and then his reception in 18th century uh, France. After Cromwell's death in 1658, a petition inspired by Harrington's principles was presented to the reconvened rump parliament. Attacks came from all sides. Royalists uh, and Republicans alike rejected the project, which, uh, according to them, ran against the grain of English popular culture. It was of foreign and pagan origin. Uh, and, um, well, so I, 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 a few years ago, I took a look at the, the really the reception of this uh, uh, project in, in 1659, and um, I was very interesting, interested in seeing that uh, Milton's party, uh, as, uh, well, Martin Zelzanis calls them, uh, were deadly against uh, the project. Um, considering that uh, precisely uh, uh, targeting the democratic component of the project, 
Uh, and considering that English people had not received sufficient political education, therefore elections uh, were bound uh, to bring back the royalists to power. Harrington retorted by denouncing a republican oligarchy, a republic of the saints. His plan was therefore not adopted and the monarchy was finally restored in 1660. For Harrington, the equal republic remained an unattainable horizon, an imaginary republic, as Blandine Criegel put it in her recent book on Renaissance political thought. But was this republic dead and buried? Not exactly, because there's strong evidence of Harrington's presence in 18th century France and on the continent. Firstly, in the spirit of the laws, uh, published in 1748, uh, the English thinker is cited in two strategic places uh, in the work, in the central chapter on the Constitution of England and at the end of Book 29, which was meant to close the work before the publisher asked for two additional chapters. Harrington is cited, along with Algin and Sidney, the Whig martyr, as a major thinker of political liberty, you have uh, the quote here in French. But according to Montesquieu, Harrington was fundamentally mistaken in discarding the country's ancestral institutions and predicting the institution of the Republic. Another sign of Harrington's presence in the long, um, uh, is, sorry, the long article devoted to him by Chevalier Jocourt uh, in the 1765 volume of uh, the Encyclopédie. Although, uh, so the article is entitled Rutland, the, the name of uh, the county uh, Harrington was born. Although Jocourt took a critical distance from the English thinker, he nonetheless recommended readers to consult the works of this beautiful genius. Uh, uh, and he refers specifically to the 1737 edition. So um, apparently, Jocourt seems to follow, uh, to take the cue from Montesquieu. But at the same time, what well, says if you want to read him, <laughs> please uh, take a look at the 1737 edition. And, uh, in the book, I tried, so I, I, uh, um, I followed in the steps of uh, uh, recent studies about l'encyclopédie, uh, which uh, uh, show, um, well, a, a, a reading, well, the, the kind of reading strategy you can have in reading the encyclopédie, well, reading one article next uh, to, to the other, and, uh, well, building, uh, well, building, uh, well, uh, some bridges between the, the articles. And so um, I found it, so I took a look at, I, I haven't read the whole encyclopedia, I must confess, but I took a look at a number of articles which uh, sounded interesting. Uh, La République de Platon, I mentioned Democracy, Oclocracy, Pologne, etc., and tried to, uh, most of them uh, were signed by Jocourt, who was actually the most prolific uh, writer, contributors. Um, later, under the French Revolution, um, uh, well, Harrington's works were published, I, I, as I mentioned, in the year three of the uh, Republic. Um, two separate editions um, were published. First of all, Aphorisme politique, translated by Pierre-François Aubin, a very small volume, I remember, a long time ago, uh, uh, talking about this in Sheffield, <laughs> and that was really the starting point of my research, so very uh, uh, small volume that you could carry around in your pocket, uh, sexto decimo, uh, on the left, and um, uh, an oeuvre politique. Um, so the first one, uh, both of them say traduit de l'anglais, the names of the translators do not appear, um, the first one was actually translated by Pierre-François Aubin, the second one by Pierre-François-Henri Rago, 
a, 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 a much um, larger volume, more expensive volume, published in, uh, uh, in series, apparently published as it was being translated, uh, and, um, uh, well, in a, in a larger format. Uh, so both volumes were published within a few months uh, of the promulgation of the Constitution of the Year Three, which was apparently strongly inspired by Harrington's precepts. And it is particularly moving to read the translator's preface of uh, Oeuvre Politique, uh, where Henri Rago seems to be convinced his living through events similar to those experienced by the people during the first English Revolution, and especially uh, uh, in 1658-59, at a time when um, uh, English people, well, he imagined people were uh, uh, getting tired and wearied and, and, and were uh, despairing of seeing, uh, uh, well, a stable uh, republic established. Hence, uh, Henri Rago's conviction that it is of prime importance to, uh, I quote, study one revolution through Harrington's writings to better guess the aftermath of the other the unfolding of the other, les suites de l'autre, he says. Another striking sign of Harrington's presence in the 18th century uh, and under the revolution is the appearance of a poster on the walls of Paris in March 1793, an episode mentioned by Saint-Just uh, in a report to the Convention Nationale. Uh, so you have the quote in French uh, here, I uh, may read it. Bourgeois, peuple industrieux, sans culotte, réunissez-vous, armez-vous, formez de saintes associations, quittez un instant vos travaux et ne les reprenez que quand vous aurez chassé les brigands des clubs, des sections et de la Convention nationale et qu'elle sera composée entièrement de vrais républicains et d'amis de la Concorde et des, vir des vertus. Signed Harrington. Uh, so who was behind the pseudo? At first, a cer certain Aubert uh, was suspected. Aubert was connected uh, to the Girondins and to Brissot de Varville uh, in particular. Uh, he was the author of a book entitled Jean-Jacques Rousseau à l'Assemblée Nationale, published in 1789, oh, that's Aubert, uh, in which he announced the drafting of a plan de législation based on Oceana. And uh, this plan de législation was supposedly written by another uh, man I will mention again, uh, who has been studied in detail by Rachel Hammersley, Jean-Jacques Rutledge, uh, who played an important part in, uh, uh, well, disseminating uh, the works of Harrington in 18th century France. In fact, it was eventually, well, it was eventually a man called Dufriche Valazé who was arrested and executed for allegedly plotting against uh, the Comité de Salut Public. But of course, uh, what is interesting uh, to us here is that at this stage of the revolution, Harrington had become the name of a Girondin conspiracy uh, aiming to restore the monarchy, which is very interesting because I, personally I don't believe uh, there's any monarchical component in Harrington's Republic, but some think there is, but I'm not convinced about that. Um, so from such fragments, I attempted to trace the history of Harrington's reception in 18th century France. The project was twofold. First, I aim to reconstruct the chain through which his ideas made their way to the continent. And in this perspective, one has to mention the central role played by John Toland, who at the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, so uh, this major free uh, thinker of Irish descent, um, who at the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries edited uh, most of the works of the great thinkers of the English Revolution, uh, Algin and Sidney, Edmund Ludlow, uh, Ludlow's memoirs, which were 
partly rewritten, but still, uh, Harrington's works, as well as a biography of Milton. Um, well, Toland was hi hired by uh, Robert Harley to do so, uh, but, well, there's a lot to say about, uh, well, the strategy consisting in publishing all these uh, Republican texts, uh, well, in the midst of a well, uh, political campaign in, in, uh, in Parliament. Uh, the English editions uh, were thus re were reviewed in the French Huguenot periodicals uh, printed in Holland, and um, these. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the Toland edition of Harrington's political works published uh, in 1700 as a, an infolio, very uh, beautiful book. And so uh, these uh, books were then uh, reviewed. Uh, in uh, the Huguenot periodicals uh, printed in Holland, uh, sometimes uh, giving way to immediate translations. And this was the case of uh, the discourses concerning government by Sydney, which, was, which uh, were immediately translate, published in 1698 and translated in 1702. Um, Pierre-Auguste Sanson. However, this was not the case with Harrington's works. So I wanted to show how these early reviews made it possible to transpose some of his concepts and propositions into French, even before their public, if not official, translation in uh, the year three of the Republic. Thus, uh, throughout the century, we find quotations, commentaries, and partial translations, translations before the translation, of Harrington's writings in a number of sources, among which, uh, well, the selected extracts um, of another text by Harrington, uh, a small uh, volume of aphorisms he published, he, he didn't, wasn't published then, but he wrote uh, probably in 1649 entitled The System of Politics that appeared uh, in uh, 1791 as uh, shown by Rachel Hammersley in the, the newspaper called Le Creuset. Um, so I, I also wanted to highlight the mediation provided by the translation of other works such as uh, David Hume's political essays, in which the Scottish philosopher engages in a critical dialogue with the English uh, theorist. Uh, so the essays uh, by Hume uh, were uh, new many, many uh, editions, French uh, editions, successive editions uh, you have here. Uh, and which were published uh, as Discours Politique and later as Essais Moraux et Politique, uh, and uh, which uh, obviously were extremely successful with French speaking readers. In my opinion, they bear, and, and David Hume, I'm going to show you um, uh, an instance of that. Uh, David Hume uh, commented on, uh, on Harrington's project, <coughs> and uh, such uh, translations. Uh, bear witness to a Franco-British conversation, the terms of which uh, were set, in my opinion, were set by Montesquieu on uh, the specific constitutional dispositions, uh, on the Harringtonian notion of balance, which was uh, constantly used by uh, Hume, and on the respective values of utopia and history in the development of political science. Uh, so this is uh, the well one of the excerpts I, I uh, refer I was referring to uh, the idea of uh, of a perfect Commonwealth uh, translated as idée d'une république parfaite in the 1756 edition, the Discours Politique, uh, where um, well Harrington's uh, Republic is uh, sits along uh, Utopia by more. Uh, and, uh, is this, and, and Plato's Republic, obviously, and is described as, I quote, le seul modèle estimable de république que l'on ait encore offert au public. C'est le CNA, and there ensued a long uh, 
uh, well, sort of running commentary on, uh, on Oceana. Um, so this was the first, uh, uh, first uh, step uh, I, 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 uh, of my research. Second, um, I sought to understand how the ideas of the English thinker were passed on and how the historical agents of the Enlightenment and the Revolution seized upon them and gave them a particular orientation according to their own circumstances. This involved assessing the historical and ideological implications of the act of translating. And uh, obviously, to this end, um, I sought uh, to take into account the contribution of the, the theories of reception and cultural transfer, the history of translation, and material culture. Thus, uh, the Huguenots of the first half of the century, who were suffering the agonies of exile, were keen to emphasize the political and religious freedom promoted by Harrington. Uh, they seem to relate with, uh, of course, his uh, promotion of uh, liberty of conscience I haven't really insisted on, but which is uh, present. Uh, he came up with a very specific kind of religious uh, settlement. Another instance is um, the way uh, Harrington or Neo-Harringtonian, and this is one of the issues, obviously, the extent to which uh, the, the sort of indirect uh, well, legacy of Harrington in various uh, tracts uh, of the, the 18th century uh, were used in, um, in the 1770s, for example, against the backdrop of uh, corn shortage, uh, la guerre des blés, uh, and the, the, the controversies uh, about, uh, uh, well, uh, laissez-faire theories and, uh, and laissez-faire legislation implemented by Turgot. And uh, as has been shown by uh, a colleague, uh, Arnaud Skorniki, who's specialist in uh, uh, the history of economic thought, um, well, we have a number of, um, of economic thinkers who were also translators and who mobilized, uh, so Forbonnet, Leblanc, uh, Robinet, um, who, uh, and, and Necker himself, uh, who, uh, well, uh, translated uh, so, some of these uh, tracts where you find neo-Harringtonian uh, theories, for example, by uh, Davenant. Uh, and, uh, well, in order to uh, contest the physiocratic uh, uh, theory of, uh, well, illimited uh, growth. Um, later, during the revolution in the summer of 1792, when a republican constitution for France was being debated, Jean-Jacques Rutledge, Rutledge and the Cordeliers, the Club des Cordeliers, uh, took a particular interest in the democratic dimension of the Harringtonian project as studied by Rachel Hammersley. In the year three, the objectives changed. After the failure of the policy of the Committee of Public Safety and the death of Robespierre, people were more concerned with stabilizing uh, the Republic, giving new relevance to the notion of the balance of power. This was the case uh, of the legislators, Sieyès, Dounou, and some members of uh, La Commission des Onze uh, in charge of drafting the new constitution. But it was also the case uh, of ordinary citizens, uh, as Raymond Meunier calls them, with an interest in foreign cultures. So this is uh, the case of uh, Henri Rago, I mentioned, the translator of Oeuvre Politique, who was a former court clerk in Nancy and who established himself as a translator, very pro prolific translator of English and German uh, literature and poetry, and who endeavored uh, the translation of uh, uh, Harrington's political works. Um, so he did not only tackle the difficult prose of Harrington, and this is quite of a challenge, <laughs> uh, but he used, uh, he used his preface to take part in the debate on the new constitution. And in fact, uh, the translation was published after the promulgation of the constitution, so he comments 
on uh, the, the new constitution and the way it parts from Harring Harrington's principles. So the way it looks like Harrington, but it's not exactly Harrington. At this point of time, Harrington's equal and immortal republic appeared to be a viable model as it was considered to have been sanctioned by the experience of the United States. And uh, here, the, uh, well, another uh, minor figure, but who played a major part, apparently, in the dissemination of such ideas is a, a man called Lamarck, uh, who translated um, uh, uh, John Adams, sorry, uh, uh, constitutions of the United States in, in, into, into French and who, uh, uh, who emphasized uh, the role given to the, <coughs> the place um, uh, given to, to Harrington in, in Adam's book and uh, uh, added a subtitle uh, sur la balance des pouvoirs, so really emphasizing that it was, and, and Lamar uh, was associated with the uh, members of uh, La Commission des Onze. After completing this, uh, this work, uh, it became clear to me that without ever disappearing from the collective memory of the Enlightenment, the status of Harrington's work changed over the course of this century. While it was first presented as a beautiful ideal republic, uh, as described by Jacques Bernard in La République des Lettres, a Nouvelle de la République des Lettres, sorry, uh, Oceana thus became a model that could inspire constitutional provisions and then a constitution in its own right, if I may say so, even though it was a partial adaptation of his ideas under the French Republic, thus illustrating Stéphanie Rosa's thesis on Enlightenment utopias as political programs. I now turn to the third uh, part of my presentation uh, devoted to the historiographical dimension of the survey. So what, uh, what is the, 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 the book about? It is about Harrington's reception, but it's also about the writing of, uh, uh, well, 18, the history of 18th century France and the history of the, 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 the French Revolution in particular. So beyond the intrinsic importance of Harrington's intellectual legacy, the study uh, provides one example among others of the strength of the English precedent in the development of a Republican tradition in 18th century France. And yet for a long time, the history of intellectual and cultural exchanges between the two countries and between two historical periods had long, has long been forgotten. In fact, the historiography of Anglo-American Republican legacies and that of French Republicanism seem to have developed in parallel without meeting. Let's take a look at the Anglo-American side first. In the second half of the 20th century, historians such as Carolyn Robbins and um, uh, John Pocock set themselves the goal of retrieving the origins of the American Revolution in the wake of studies on the resurgence of the Republican ideal in Renaissance Italy. I'm thinking of Hans Barron and Zero Fink, of course. The aim was to propose an alternative vision to the Whig interpretation of history which placed the Glorious Revolution, 1688, and the American Revolution of 1776 in a continuum, and which saw the latter as the culmination of the long quest for freedoms and contra contractualist uh, theories. In his monumental work, The Foundations of Modern Political Thought, Quentin Skinner looked for the roots of modern political thought in medieval scholastic philosophy while John Donne challenged the vision of a modern Locke as a precursor of the Enlightenment. These historians, often referred to as the Cambridge School, thus traced a different trajectory from the city-states of Renaissance Italy to Jeffersonian America, on the ways to the first English Revolution, which Whig historians had tended to see as an unfortunate, violent parenthesis. For such Cambridge historians, 
let's call them that. <laughs> uh, this moment was a landmark as it had revived the memory of classical or neo-Roman republicanism in England. In particular, John, Pocock, uh, John Pocock's wide-ranging fresco in the Machiavellian moment published in 1975 had the merit of proposing a new paradigm and providing food for thought for generation of historians, while at the same time provoking criticism for what it left out. Indeed, questions have been raised about the neglect, not only of 18th century France, but of the whole European continent in this history of the Machiavellian, Machiavellian legacy. And it's true that in Pocock's book, the European and French reception of Renaissance political thinking remained an unexplored sideline. He mentions Montesquieu, but just in passing. It may well be that his omission of 18th century France, in particular, had to do with uh, what Johnson Kent Wright calls a fundamentally conservative approach to republicanism, which discarded the social factor. It may also testify to a willingness to go beyond the post-war ideological controversies between Marxist and conservative historians. Bernstein, Tony, well, Bernstein is, <laughs> well, late <laughs> uh, 19th, beginning of the 20th century, then Tony Stone versus Trevor Roper, roughly, running the risk, the risk of discarding completely an important component of English republicanism and reducing it to a purely political and constitutional uh, tradition. So while it's true that Harrington's economic analyses are limited, to say the least, and seemingly out of touch with the rising political economy promoted by his own friend, William Petty, uh, uh, with whom he was, the, he organized the, the Road to Club, the value of his thinking may lies elsewhere. Uh, so perhaps we'll have the occasion to uh, elaborate on that. Still, it must be noted, so having said that, having presented this well, very roughly and schematically, this um, Anglo-American uh, historiography, it must be noted that the, or English speaking because, um, it must be noted that the 1960s and 70s saw important studies on the links between English political thought and that of the French Enlightenment, such as those by Dennis Fletcher on the re reception of Bolingbroke and Robert Shackleton on Montesquieu. And later, uh, well, historians such as uh, uh, Michael Sonnenscher and Rachel Hammersley uh, followed in. But so now what about the historiography of republicanism in France before the revolution? In the wake of the bicentenary of the French Revolution, the American historian Michael Baker spoke of a Tocqueville syndrome in reference to the author, not of so much of La Démocratie de la Démocratie en Amérique, but the author of L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution, published in 1856. Uh, Tocqueville, uh, Tocqueville, still marked by the feeling of a brutal past, break with the past, felt that nothing could have foreseen the cataclysm of 1789. And to Baker, at least, such a view may explain why, for a long time, French historians have ignored the ferment of ideas before the revolution, obscuring an entire republican tradition in France. And yet, Baker recalls in 1751, the Marquis d'Argenson, minister of Louis XV, wrote, uh, well, this is a very famous quote, il souffle d'Angleterre un vent philosophique, on entend murmurer ces mots de liberté, de républicanisme, déjà les esprits en sont pénétrés, et l'on sait à quel point l'opinion gouverne le monde. Uh, in fact, in the second half of the 20th century, little attention has been paid to the genealogy of Republican ideas in France, and in particular, to the way theoreticians of the French Revolution drew their inspiration from English Republican thinkers. One notable exception is Olivier Luteau, 
a specialist uh, of the first English Revolution and author of several comparative works on the two revolutions. Apart from that, the dominant imagery has remained that of the French Revolution as a national phenomenon, even one brought about by, by spontaneous generation. And this was the view which prevailed in the bicentenary works. And in this respect, the volume edited by Michel Vauvel is a case in point, Révolution et République, l'exception française, published in 1994. So the, the subtitle is L'exception française. However, the volume still contains a chapter by Anne Thompson about the, uh, the references to England, uh, but contained in this volume. However, uh, well, such a vision had not always, be, ha, had not always uh, prevailed. The first half of the 20th century had seen uh, the publication of several studies devoted to French Republican thought as a European phenomenon. Uh, in particular, we, we may mention the works, uh, the books by Joseph de Dieu, Pierre Ménard, Robert Deraté. While several works focused on the figure of Harrington and his legacy on the continent. Then, paradoxically, as Europe was being constructed as a political entity, the history of the reception of English republicanism in France declined. So much so, uh, at the end of the 1990s, historians such as Christine Fauré and Luc Borreau called for a long history of the French Revolution, which would take into account its European roots. In this respect, the publication in 2002 of Republicanism, a Shared European Heritage, edited by Quentin Skinner and Martin van Gelderen, uh, marked a turning point in the historiography of modern republicanism, with its desire to shift the exclusively transatlantic perspective towards Europe and uncover a common fund of political concepts that had circulated across the, co the continent. However, the approach remained more comparative than actually transnational. In 2013 and 14, the two volumes edited by Gabby Malberg and Doug Wiemann on the left uh, hand side enabled us to take better account of the circulation of English Republican ideas on the continent. The book was based on the proceedings of the 2011 Potsdam International Colloquium to mark the 400th anniversary of Harrington's birth. In April of the same year, a symposium was held in Bordeaux, uh, bringing together philosophers and historians of political ideas, and uh, well, it gave way to the proceedings uh, in the volume you have here. Uh, so these two important conferences, as well as the issue of La Révolution Française, edited by François Questana et Pierre Cernat in 2013, provided an opportunity to take stock of English republicanism to situate Harrington within this movement and to sketch a map of the transnational networks uh, allowing his ideas to spread and to be reappropriated by Enlightenment uh, thinkers. Uh, so what you have here are uh, well, more recent, very recent publications, uh, a, a re-edition of the 1702 uh, translation of um, Algernon Sinney's discourses, um, so edited by Christopher Hamel and with a very long <laughs> introduction, so really a, a, an essay, an introductory essay, uh, the monograph devoted to James Harrington by Rachel Hammersley and my book. So to conclude, uh, Harrington is therefore in England the emblematic figure of a republicanism with constitutionalist and egalitarian aims. His way, of thinking, uh, his way of thinking seems to me to be a far cry from the strongly aristocratic and anti-democratic vision, this is a quote, uh, to which the historian Jonathan Israel in particular likens English republicanism to, in which uh, he contrasts with Dutch radical republicanism. Harrington's republicanism differs from that of uh, Stubb or Milton, uh, 
who, while emphasizing political freedom, were reluctant to entrust a mandate to the people. It also differs from the republicanism of natural rights, le républicanisme des droits naturels, uh, to use Christopher Hamel's uh, formula uh, about uh, Sydney, uh, uh, about Sydney uh, and uh, well, the model of a mixed constitution. Beyond the act by which a people frees itself from a tyrannical power and proclaims its, their rights, uh, Harrington deemed paramount to ensure the stability uh, of the Republic and consider the material conditions of political freedom. By placing the notion of equality at the heart of his Republic and by proposing to reconcile classical virtue based on the perpetual participation of all in decision-making uh, with modern virtue, so classical virtue and modern virtue based on the representation, he embodies a certain modernity. This is why, in my opinion, Harrington should be read or re-read today to return to such fundamentals. <laughs>